namaste is the new normal in covid era it's time for all of us to reset and restart way forward in the obstetric practice in the covid era may of vitabiotics today provide us a unique platform to connect engage and share knowledge on obstetric practice to be followed in covid era under the guidance of one of the leading gynecological fertility of india dr hema devakar she is a leading medical professional of india with a vision to improve the healthcare service ecosystem for the welfare of women she has over the last 3 decades been a game changer in healthcare establishing new benchmark standards and touching women's life in the process she currently she holds a, holds an executive list of important positions of great responsibility within the country as well as in asia she is the vice chair of the ncd committee at figo national coordinator of figo foxy wdf program national coordinate coordinator for foxy quality initiative in the year 2013 she was the president of foxy she also uh, been awarded as a figo women achievers award and icons of healthcare award singapore and she is also a ceo chairman of artist currently actively she is working with a uh, government of india on research projects in rural india a national technical expert for skilled birth attendance training over to you ma'am thank you very much raksha as she has said say namaste everyone and i am so delighted today to bring you this program of knowledge share through mayo beta biotics and indeed in this new covid-19 era we have crossed the geographical boundaries and trying to make history it's my pleasure and privilege to introduce to you two of my very beloved friends and very distinguished colleagues who have continued to inspire me and support me for a variety of initiatives not only within local and national regions but also as i said in the entire asian regions and figo let me introduce you to dr sanjay gupte who as i said is a beloved colleague always saying yes for anything which is a deliberation towards the meaningful end of sharing experiences and knowledge and i'm quite sure that with his innovative inputs in the question and answer session he will have many many practical tips to give us how the lower and middle income countries are sorting our own issues in our own house amidst the scare and the nightmare of the corona pandemic dr gupte has been the past president of foxy which is our parent organization he is presently the chair of the ethics committee of figo and also the figo representative from our nation so as a true ambassador he has carried back and forth many of the novel initiatives for the good of the health of girls and women thank you very much for being with us sanjay at a very very short notice and we know that we are pulling everybody out from their valuable time and we sincerely acknowledge and appreciate that another very distinguished guest whose main mantra is never say no that's dr jayam kannan for us she has been the past vice president of foxy hailing from chennai and trichy and in the year 2013 when she ran a massive program pan india called helping mothers survive she was duly acknowledged by the state government for bringing down the maternal and infant mortality she is the leading champion now for another quality initiative called manyata where the staffs of each and every of the private sectors headed by her and the other leaders down south is making waves in the asian regions and dr jayam i must share with you that because of a 
massive initiative in South of India in the recent past on this very digital platform. Everybody has got sensitized to the fact that this is the way forward. And just at the right time, we had the silver lining with the corona pandemic to tell us, indeed, this is the way forward. There is absolutely no other way of connect. And there's a load of achievements and accomplishments of Dr. Jayam Kannan, an evergreen champion whom we are very, very proud of. She is indeed an asset to any organization and all communities at large. So thank you, Jayam, for being with us. So now, what have we set out for ourselves this afternoon? The next couple of minutes, I want to place some overview of what do we mean by reset and restart. What is it that we as obstetricians have to reset amidst our own practice, inclusive of resetting our own minds? And what is it that we have to restart? Yes, the lockdowns will be soon over. We have to restart the practice in the best manner that we can and we should. And how do we move ahead in the post-corona era? That will be a short deliberation. But I gather from the Mayor Vitabiotics that our friends from other regions such as Nepal, Bangladesh, and uh, uh, South African and regions beyond the geographies of our own country, India, are joining us. We welcome all of you to this deliberation. Please jot your questions in the chat box. We will make our honest and humble attempts to say as much as we can, though the whole world in reality knows as little as only the four month old pandemic. So how did our story start? Dr. Gupte is from Pune, and this was one of the media reports which said that there was another young doctor in Pune, 30 years old, who was doing his own scans, and he was tested COVID-19 positive. So the 69 pregnant women who were seen by him in that span of time, all had to be traced, tested, quarantined, and thereby the sixth sense of any OBGYNs, the scans that are bedside and so routinely we are accustomed to do it. Just see the scenario now. The sonologist or the obstetrician who is doing the scan is also in the PPE because such was the scare and the plastic curtains with a tiny hole drilled out there for the hand and the probe to go in so that there is a distance maintained with the patient, but the job of the scan is done. And again, this area needs the reset and restart because the cleaning of the entire machine and the cables, spacing out one patient to another, at least at a duration of 40 minutes, uh, per scan schedule, all of this, of course, is very much in the new normal. What does the UN report say? This is applicable for, to the other Asian countries as well. It says India will be the largest producer of 20 million babies in the next nine months. And the obstetric um, community, the care providers are really burnt out and already stressed to handle these volumes. Yes, social distancing should be maintained. And you see the crowd in any antenatal clinic in a public facility, about at least 150, 200 patients. So what do you do with them? So there is an open ground where everybody is sitting in their own circles and a bunch of 10 are called inside. They're not supposed to carry any bags with them. They're not supposed to get their relative inside because the distance has to be maintained and the crowds minimized. As of now, I'm sure in many of your countries as well as in India, the burden is on the public institutes. There is already a huge complaint and Dr. Jayan will tell you more about it, that all the private doctors 
whenever there is a suspicion, they're just pushing the patient to a public center. Whether the patient likes it or not, whether the patient wants it or not, as private providers, the due care, there is a barrier or an apprehension in offering that care and there she goes to a public health facility or a government hospital. There's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of frustration, a lot of confusion, not only amidst the patient, but amidst the doctors as well. So how have we reset our antenatal protocols? No six, eight, ten visits by the patients anymore. She has to come for a minimum of three visits, one at 12 weeks, one at 20 weeks, and one near about term. The rest of the handling has to be done on a video call or a um, chat option or just a routine telephone call. And we are happy today that many Indian, with, irrespective of their economy, they may not have much else in their home, but they will have a mobile in their hand. This has come in very handy, I must say, for our connect with the patient. This is for the low risk antenatal patient. If she has any comorbidities like diabetes in pregnancy or hypertensive disorders, of course, you will need to call her more often than the schedules that we have displayed here. So the telemedicine, telecommunication is the new era. Connect with our patients. There is a lot of social media buzz going on about building up the immunity. And there are many, many patients asking us time and again, vitamin C, the role of vitamin D, B12, folic acid, yogurt, garlic, this, that, and the other to build the immunity. Well, to share with you the truth, there were many deliberations we did also through Maya Vita Biotics that all of these are so very important even in the pre-COVID era, because the calcium, folic acid, vitamin B12, vitamin D, these are a must. There is not going to be any compromise, especially during pregnancy. And to avert uh, premature labor, we also spoke about the omega-3 fatty acids, all these nutraceuticals, the calciums, the essential vitamins, the micronutrients, which we used to give the least priority, have surfaced up now into the top position for building up the immunity and the recognition that these are ever so important. We are revisiting the role of calcium. We are revisiting the role of vitamin D3. What advantages does it carry? Just beyond saying that these are the supplements. So not only building up the immune system, as you can see here in the American Clinical Endocrinology mm -hmm. journals, they have outlined the specific roles of these. So it's time that we get a little more serious about these prescriptions. Again, we are coming to reset. Resetting right from the entrance of your small nursing home, medium-sized, large corporate hospital. It doesn't matter. Entrance is an entrance. And the security has to wear a mask. The patient and the relative has to wear a mask. Hand has to be sanitized. Temperature has to be taken. And... Just a quick history to see whether this patient can be diverted to the general outpatient area or they have to go through a narrow lane to a special area segregated with the suspicion that they may be COVID positive. Well, what do you ask in the history? T-O-C-C. -C. T for travel, O for occupation, because if it's a healthcare worker, then you need to pay attention. C for contact and C for cluster or containment area. Because if the patient has any of these, again, you raise your antenna, suspicions are very, very high and you need to pay particularly. Just yesterday, there was a major hospital in Bengaluru which closed because there was a patient who was actually from the containment area but showed a wrong address saying, that he is from a neighborhood. It's entirely diagonally opposite geography of Bengaluru where he has come and got himself admitted. Three days later, the government traced him to be from that area, which is a containment zone. And indeed, he was proven positive. The entire staff who was dealing with him in the three days are out of the hospital, quarantined, and the hospital has nobody else to run the hospital. So it's under... Love. 
and key. So there's a huge lot of commotion going on in this backdrop. So please, please try and elicit honest answers, ask for their Aadhaar card or whatever. So these geographies, specific geographies where they come, the zones which are marked, etc. Very, very crucial. Of course, the symptoms to the list of cough, cold, fever, abdominal cramps, diarrhea, headache, it's also added now, loss of smell, loss of taste. These two are the new things, which means he may have a cluster of all these symptoms, which are so non-specific, may not have any symptoms at all, till the people who are symptomatic need to be paid special attention to. Of course, there is a chance that without any symptoms also, they can prove positive, but if they do have the symptoms, please, please segregate them in a separate entrance area, a fever test or a suspicion raising desk where some further um, testing has to be done before they enter the general area of the hospital. Again, another important part of the history, comorbidities like hypertension, diabetes, etc. is a must. And also we have urged the government to please document the history whether this patient is pregnant or not because we want this cluster of the information for ourselves to see the way forward very, very soon, seeing the trends. And the age of the patient, of course, becomes very important because most of us now sitting at home because of the age of 60 plus, we're not supposed to be at work. Okay? So that is, again, something that we have to pay attention to, the age and the comorbidity, which puts the um, patients in a vulnerable bracket. Here you'll see from a small nursing home, when we deliberated about the distancing, they actually changed the entire OPD area. And even at the reception, you will find a whole row of chairs placed in front of the reception. Why? Because a person who is dealing with the front desk staff stands beyond those chairs or the tables. So it's at a larger distance from the working staff. So that's again a simple advice for resetting your front desk area and realigning the patients who go into the general OPD area, absolutely a must to keep them seated apart. The entire deliberation, today we are doing the webinar, but every day we are doing the training program for the staffs, especially in interiors and in small nursing homes. They have to learn the correct technique of hand washing, the housekeeping, etc., etc. So you will see one more picture here. When we say rational use of PPEs, everybody, including the receptionist in this nursing home, is donning the complete PPE. You know, that is the kind of scare that uh, the corona pandemic has brought about. But uh, in the Q&A session, we will speak more about the PPEs because Dr. Gupta had some very interesting things to share about the personal protective equipment even last time around. So once we have done these uh, training programs, We've had some pictures and videos from small, small nursing homes in the interiors about how now they're aware what the security should do, how the patients need to be segregated, definitely paying attention to the distancing. And even inside the so-called fever clinic or the symptom positive clinic, the doctor has to wear the PPE and be at a distance from the patient. The ultrasonography room, again, just like in the first picture, please beware that every little thing with the machine has to be cleaned, either with Cytex or with 1% um, hypochlorite solution or the alcohol scrub. All the other areas in the hospital, near the elevators, in the canteen, even big hospitals are facing huge problem because some patients really, really fight and they are not understanding the concept of distancing themselves, why and what. Coming to whom you test. Well, Symptomatic or asymptomatic, either ways we are in trouble. So TOCC, that is travel occupation, cluster containment and symptomatic, any ways you will test. All the contacts you will test and all the clusters, primary, secondary contact you will test. The new advisory, beyond 17th of April, just three weeks ago, 21st of April, created again a whole confusion because the new advisory said, Pregnant women close to the delivery date and those presenting in labor, we as obstetricians should know their status, so they, you must test them. 
Then the clarity came only if they are from the containment zone and they are coming to you, you have to test them. Well, many private clinics feel that if we test each and every one, it's safer because the status is known. So we will raise these questions again to our guests to have their responses about whether it's practical, whether it's feasible, really, to translate this into ground reality. The new thing about asymptomatic primary contact. This person doesn't have any symptoms, but he or she is the one who is COVID positive. No symptoms or mild symptoms. Somebody else in the house has had a symptom, so they have been tested positive. So whoever else is living in their home, out of five people, three are likely to be tested positive, even if they don't have any symptoms. That is the primary contact living under the same roof. When we say home quarantine, in many Indian homes, you can't have the home quarantine because there has to be a separate room with an attached toilet there where the patient has to stay in self-quarantine. Only then, so the district health authorities are actually going home and inspecting whether they are fit for a home quarantine and then they put a stamp at the back of the hand and the poster outside their house saying this house is under quarantine so that everybody knows. And the neighbor's number they will take because the neighbor has to be the spy. They will call them up and find out whether this patient is homebound or is moving out. And to that particular set of people at home, they will give a WhatsApp message every day and find out if the symptoms are worsening because they started with asymptomatic whether the symptoms are worsening and the quarantine alert. If there are symptoms worsening, it will bleep. There is an Aroke Setu app in India where 1 million users are already on the app. And if there is somebody close to our vicinity, for example, today in my Aroke Setu app, if I open it and see one kilometer radius, there are 12 patients who are COVID positive. That's the kind of alert that it will give. I think we will find our geographies in order once most of the people in the country hook on to the app. The new thing they have said is also about checking the pulse oximeter. Checking with the pulse oximeter. So many have been um, asked to buy the pulse oximeter, especially if they have the comorbidities of hypertension, heart disease or diabetes. The SpO2 levels also, they have to report every day in addition to their temperature. If many, many patients have to be tested, either they have to come to us or we have to go to them. So the COVID testing kiosks are put up in many places so that the person who is testing is inside the kiosk and only the cloud hands will move out of the kiosk to test the, uh, take the throat swabs. The mobile vans are also in place in many communities because especially in one containment area in Bangalore, the whole population has been seen and studied. Whoever is the pregnant patient there due for delivery in the next 15 days, they're going to the home of the pregnant patient, taking the throat swabs and letting us know whether she is positive or not. So how do we segregate? Till now we were speaking about suspicion and just raising the concern and taking the swabs. If the swab is positive, that means it is COVID positive. They can be in mild, moderate or severe categories. If it's mild, they go into the COVID care centers, which can be their own homes with the stamping and the WhatsApp messages and the poster outside the house, etc. Or as how the reality in India speaks, they have to be in makeshift quarantine. That is hostels, hotels, guest houses, stadiums, etc., where they have to be isolated and kept there. The moderate cases with little breathing difficulty, etc., will need a isolated bed with oxygen supply. So they will be in a dedicated wing of a big tertiary care hospital. Those who are really, really sick will have to go into the COVID-dedicated hospitals. We will want Dr. Gupte's um, um, flashback on what better the state of Maharashtra would have done. Why big COVID dedicated hospitals are not yet identified there because in the city of Bengaluru, 
the major teaching hospital, which is the Victoria Hospital, with more than 1,000 beds, has been kept aside as a dedicated COVID hospital. Occupancy as on today is only 10%. We are waiting for the cases to escalate and they're keeping our fingers crossed that all beds should not be occupied. But there is a provision at least. But this has not happened in some other states and uh, in the leadership position. We have to voice out our concerns and see to it that both in the government and the uh, private, these facilities should be offered. So if she is in the antenatal period, not yet due for delivery, but she hits the contact and you have tested her and she is positive and, and she doesn't have any symptoms, please do not call her for a checkup at least for 14 days. And if she has worsened in those 14 days, then she must be called and she must be referred to the right place. So if the pre pregnant patient has tested positive today, but she had come to your clinic even last week. And there were some of your staff who didn't know that she would test positive further on in her pregnancy. They have handled her without a PPE. All of those staff will need to be quarantined for 14 days and their tests have to be repeated twice as well. So the patient is developing more symptoms. A chest X-ray with her consent is a must with abdominal shielding. And again, based on her symptoms, you'll categorize her into mild, moderate, or severe. The mild cases, we said, only observation and isolation. Moderate cases in big hospitals, put them on the special floor. They may just need some supportive therapy, rest, oxygen, uh, supplementation, and the fluid management, nutritional care, etc. They will come around. But some of the concerns of the obstetrician, just the paracetamol for fever, and if she's not very sick, please discuss with the intensive care specialist and you can give her the antenatal steroids for pulmonary maturity. Please reassure the patient that in the available literature, the chances for a vertical transmission, chances for a miscarriage, chances for birth defect, chances for preterm labor per se are really not so much. And the COVID-19 has not been found in vaginal secretions or the breast milk. So this much is the good news. But if she's asymptomatic today, closer to 32, 33 weeks, if you're allowed to give the steroid for pulmonary maturity, please go ahead and give it. Because if she worsens and you have to intervene, then at least you'll get away with a good outcome for the baby. Intensive care specialist, where I would just like to just highlight one point on QSOFA score. This is SOFA is sequential major organ deterioration, as we have said here, quick sequential organ failure assessment. That is SOFA for you. And if any of these two things are positive, either she's losing her mental alertness or her respiratory rate is becoming more than 22 or her BP is dropping, you're in for trouble. Please, you will need help from the intensive care. It is not the forte of an obstetrician. What do they do there? One line of treatment is hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin. The other line is antiviral. The FOXI guidelines which have been released do give all these details and it's there on foxy.org website. None of them have a substantial literature support, but this is just for us to know that 10 days, 5 days, 7 days, different regimes of therapy are there. And azithromycin is an add-on and lopinavir and ritonavir were considered to be antiviral, but now uh, Fauci has said something new like <coughs> remisophil or some, all these tongue twisting names which we as obstetricians are not familiar with. Nothing has stood the test of time so far. What is our plight? Dr. Gupte, Dr. Jayam Kannan, who will be doing a huge load of deliveries. Well, in the operation theater, it's a timed procedure. PPE, yes, go through it and come up. But in the normal deliveries, if you are to presume every single patient is a COVID positive unless proved otherwise, this will be the situation of your labor room. Both you and your assistant wearing PPEs, not four or five people roaming around in the labor room unnecessarily. No companion, only the video call the patient can take. Even the child's resuscitation has to be far further away with the neonatologist in the PPE. 
We will ask our experts whether there are two schools of thoughts, what do they follow? Either rooming in with the mother, but with the mask to the mother and hand sanitization, or keeping the baby away, isolated, and giving express breast milk. So the reality is that the staff situation is totally disrupted. They are scared to come back on duty. Half of them drop out and have run away to their villages. We say hand wash, hand wash, hand wash. These are some novel devices made for hand wash and soap dispensing now because water and wash basins are not available in every nook and corner. These kind of posters, as much as you re-emphasize, as much as you deliberate with the um, staff and the people around is really, really worthwhile. Every two, three hours, this has to be a common scenario in the hospitals of the disinfection protocols and housekeeping. Please tell your staff after going home, hand wash, shower, uh, soak your clothes in hot water one hour and then dry them in the sun. The distancing also needs to be continued at home, especially if they have little children and elderly parents. So the voices from the ground, what have our own people done and how they have sorted out? The Western world thinks, oh, these are in the low and middle income countries. We in the high fi countries are finding it so difficult. How will they manage? Well, necessity is the mother of invention and innovation. And the security, who is wise, otherwise he's just guarding, but now he knows about the mask and hand sanitization and the quick check, the raincoat material, which is a breathable material, which was brought to our notice by Dr. Gupte. Already it is in use in several of the hospitals who have sent me the pictures, Dr. Gupte, after the last deliberation that we had, that they have now started giving raincoats to all their housekeeping staff and all their assistants because it is so uh, doable. So it is some innovative idea quickly put into action and we really, really appreciate the proactiveness. Then the uh, sanitization of the table and the chair after every patient uh, moves up and down the chair, just like the uh, scan um, with a plastic curtain and one hole there for the hand to go in. They have said that they have had these curtains for examining all patients with two holes there to check the BP. Okay, so that they have uh, every day we are getting some uh, new uh, innovative uh, ideas uh, from everywhere around the country, and therefore I. Uh, Again, once again, place on records and appreciate the mayor with biotics for having put us together again to deliberate with a large section of you because this is an exchange platform of many, many ideas, many challenges which are turned into opportunities and many collaborative efforts because we need to be together in this fight against the coronavirus. So from the makers of Calcimax and Pregnacare. Once again, we welcome our distinguished guests to the forum and we eagerly await your questions for discussion, deliberations, agreement, disagreement, etc. So thank you very much for being patient, Dr. Gupte and uh, Dr. Jayan. Uh, <laughs> uh, as I said in the opening, that uh, we have an extended expanse of an audience with us. Uh, so we wanted to give a quick uh, uh, overview of uh, the reset and uh, restart. So uh, let me just uh, uh, go to uh, Dr. Um, Gupte first to give his flashback impressions about what has changed in his practice in the last month or so. Dr. Gupte. You have to unmute and speak. Yeah. Just, just can you unmute, uh, sir? Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So 
you know things have changed a lot and from the beginning gradually people have realized the importance of what's uh, happening uh, there is more awareness to be very uh, clear amongst the patients and amongst the staff that's a good thing initially there was a lot of panic you know about all this now i think people are getting over that you know panic situation which is very important and i think that's one of our main jobs as uh, you know doctors and obstetricians that our patients are so stressed that the fear should be done away with we should properly educate them you have put forward a lot of things in your presentation i think that those are the right th- things and exactly that's what what is happening you know initially after a lot of panic right from dr now- gupte sure. dr gupte i need you to decode one thing 5550 just make one guess of what is 5550 i'm really excited about that <laughs> 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 5550 Uh-huh. and it gets a block and thank you very much all of you okay. <laughs> yeah that's okay. a great number so okay. we have an opportunity to uh, touch base with the, all of you and we would like to hear more from you beyond this program as well so dr gupte your right. uh, thoughts and the words will be very very valuable to the I large think community the first, first message is don't panic yourself and you know don't let your patients panic they are already under stress all the pregnant patients have been told that they are most vulnerable and you know they are worried at home and they don't know exactly what to do but if we tell them the simple things of isolation isolation in a sense you know just protecting themselves by a mask protecting themselves by washing hands protecting themselves by you know not touching mouth and nose and the <coughs> you know eyes you know they say don't follow the main you know the, you know what that is don't follow the main that both mouth no eyes and nose yeah <laughs> <laughs> and follow the women you know that <laughs> yeah that you must wash your hands <laughs> so oh, so observe social distancing and things yeah, like yeah. that so the right. men and women <laughs> yeah right. drilling that so, again and again um, um Yeah, uh, Dr. Gupte, one follow-up question for you about mm. um, the HCQs for healthcare providers within your mm. own setup. What That's is right. your personal advice, and what is the general advisory which is running in our country? We we have to innovate. We have to think of you know new things, and so we have come up with various kinds of uh, you know gears. And if I if you may, I no will... HC HCQ. Oh, okay, HCQ. Okay, I think. SCQ being a safe medicine, we still do not know whether it really acts or not. But yes, if you ask me, yes, I started taking SCQ long back uh, because you know I have been giving that to many of my uh, patients in the past, who are uh, SLE patients and so on. It's absolutely a safe medicine, and there's no harm in taking it. It is. still to be proven finally whether it is going to make a difference or not again lot of studies are going on but uh, you know when it came in the this thing and as we know that it might have a good effect you know so you know many of the physicians that i know also are uh, you know taking scq because this is a norm that we may come across a patient who is asymptomatic with unknowingly who, <coughs> who is covid positive so that's an added protection that we can have So HCQ or no HCQ is not a false sense of complacency. You have still to follow all the universal precautions that you have to. But the time will tell us whether all the healthcare providers who are on HCQ in their setting, if a patient is tested COVID positive, mm-hmm. because they have come come in contact with the patient with or without the uh, PPE, whether they will test positive or not and having tested positive whether the severity of their symptoms will be lesser than those who haven't taken the hcq so i think the time uh, will tell us uh, if we really observe um, uh, because it's just now going on a blind faith yes. of our own experience with hcq no we are confident of giving and some are being totally against it i swing back to dr jayam kanan because mm-hmm. there was one case in uh, tamil nadu 
where this HCQ uh, to a doctor created a lot of issues. Any comments about that, Dr. Jay? Before I go yes. on to the next uh, set of questions, yeah. In Tamil Nadu, the, I, I hope you know the situation is not very good. We are really into jittery state. Mm. I am in a hot, hot, hotter area. That is Kodambato. We have got not a red, it's a dark red area. Mm. And here, the question of giving HCQ and other things is only in the hands of the government and the government COVID centers or the allotted centers like Apollo, which has been given the permission. Otherwise, we are not allowed to give the prescription and they are not taking. If supposing you have a hospital in which a COVID case has been found, now the hospital is closed. I still feel the apathy of one big center which is running for the past 70 years, every day conducting 30 deliveries. The hospital is closed, the doctors are kept under quarantine, respectively depending on the mild, moderate, severe in their government setups, the patients are running from pillar to post. Because no private hospital is taking unbooked case. Even the multi-speciality university hospitals are not taking unbooked cases because there is lack of blood, lack of stuff. So I still appreciate one of our senior obstetrician who, after the patient ran for six hours, finally took the patient unbooked and delivered. Because such a big problem when a doctor is quarantined is going on. So in Tamil Nadu, HCQ is not allowed to be given by us. Whereas the prophylactic use with proper prescription, which is scrutinized by the government department alone is being allowed. Here, HCQ is a question of the debate here. Yeah, and uh, in, the, in the same breath, you know, when you said patient is running from pillar to post, why do you think the private practitioners are actually scared to handle the cases uh, in general? Because if we are to presume many asymptomatic cases who's not been tested, their status is not known, we are supposed to follow the universal precaution. Is it only in theory? Can we not use the universal precautions like how we used to do for the HIV and go ahead and deliver the patients? What is uh, What do you think is right or wrong with the mindset of many, many private settings. Jaya? Doctors are scared. If supposing they handle a patient and later on they find that somebody is COVID positive, the hospital is closed. And mind you, I tell you, it is two months since one large private center, public health center, which was closed in the month of March, is still not to be opened because the government regulations of an entry, exit, differ, they, they sing. the location of the outpatient, the area allotted, the laboratory allotment, the scan room allotment, all these things so far has not been taken up. So now they say you should have this much of space between these things. Since you don't have it, I cannot allow the center to be opened. This is a charity institution which is not being opened. Yeah, Dr. Gupte. Yes, I think, you know, as an health expert, I think this is where we need to intervene. And we did that in Maharashtra because initially the same objection was there of, you know, closing. Even if a single case is there, they were trying to close the hospitals. But we talked to the, you know, authorities, divisional commissioners and so on. We explained to them that if you keep on doing that, eventually you won't have any staff and the hospitals, you know, left to treat any patients. They agreed to that. Now the thing is, the the, the guidelines are cha have changed, at least in Maharashtra. It's like you know, if you use the PPE, there is absolutely no need for you to get quarantined, you know, in your own hospital also. And if you, uh, you know, then only the place has to be, you know, sanitized. And there are ways and it can be done uh, a few in few hours time. And even if you are not used, you know, a full-fledged PPE, then you are quarantined only till, 
your test is done which is about you know 3 to 4 days the result comes and you know then uh, you, you know you're not uh, made to sit home for 14 days and so on so i think these practical measures now we have to take you know because otherwise i mean that quarantine is 29 days but that's ridiculous you know we will not have any uh, my son came from places. turkey on 10th of march so my house was quarantined up to 9th of april 29 days of quarantine so i think we might have seen about so many cases in tamil nadu i think people will become more reasonable as they realize you know because there are asymptomatic cases there are false positive tests you know 30% of the uh, tests are you know uh, false negative you know then uh, 80% of the cases are com- coming asymptomatic so what are we going to do you know uh, you can't go on testing every single one and then uh, not deliver the patients send all the patients to the government facilities and where are the, you know the facilities you know in the government setup also so fortunately we told and they agreed to have one you know specifically specifically a delivery covid delivery center also which is an important thing you know we have you can't deliver patients who are asymptomatic most of the times who are pregnant may be positive but asymptomatic you can't take them to government centers where who are which are already loaded with uh, you know all the uh, very serious patients in icu and hope that they will also help in delivering the patients no we have to have separate delivery centers for covid positive patients where the Uh, all the guidelines are different and they are meant for you know delivery and the baby as dr hema told her you know in in her presentation so there have to be these centers now identified dr gupta one follow up question for you since uh, we are talking about the rational use of ppe yes as of now presuming that all patients are to be treated as covid positive whether they tested or not whether they are symptomatic or not what is the kind of attire you suggest in your consulting room and in the labor room because in the ot i mean everybody's mindset says yeah they have to be the pp so that is a given you know in ot everybody is ready to use from shoe cover to everything they will use but what about the opds and what about the labor for normal labor yeah. so so how long we, how much and what all <laughs> right so what we need in the basically in the uh, opd is you know protecting our face and the upper area and down below there can be a, a gown which can be a kind of a reusable uh, you know kind of pp you may call it so pps are of also different kind so if you don't mind i'll say, show you again the demonstration with one of yes. my <laughs> <laughs> we waited for that if uh, uh, the team uh, uh, supo and team can uh, uh, right. pin uh, uh, dr gupte uh, on the lab screen it'll be really good because yeah, we were, we were oh thank you so much <laughs> uh, so this, <laughs> thank this, you very this, very much <laughs> reusable uh, pp this can be washed this can be sanitized with you know, uh, you know uh, hydrogen peroxide uh, uh, chloride you can put whatever you want you can spray it doesn't get inside it impervious to water so it won't get to uh, wet and as you see there is a n95 mask there is a shield and there is also a you know head head gear and this head gear you know can be pushed because you know we tied the head gear on the you know ears but if you put it then the ears you can't put your stethos stethoscope inside so it can be pushed inside there are simpler you know uh, this thing also this can be used for opd staff so look at the, you know this kind of a you know here now you will see yeah this is so this this is again made of same same material it is impervious to you know uh, you know water it's impervious actually if you count in gsm this is 160 gsm oh so relatively it is much thicker than the pp uh, you know pp pp obviously when you you know make it little more thick then it becomes more uh, unbreathable so you know working in this for a long long time if you are the full this thing becomes definitely uh, you know uh, uh, difficult but it's very light and so it can be very easily removed used whatever and you know this donning and doffing procedure becomes absolutely easy then there are these you know uh, you know foot this thing of covers also shoe covers yeah the shoe covers so they can, they come right up to your actually you know just below the knee and there is a cover 
going above them so you don't actually this all the surfaces which are practically covered well and you know you don't uh, get and this is not difficult to make at all you know one can properly stitch is the care that has to be taken after stitching and that's what we realize after some tests that wherever you are stitch you know those areas you know can sometimes start leaking and that's why you have to be very careful and then you have to actually put uh, you know water or uh, uh, this thing on it to make sure that there is no leak like we see in the you know taking out the puncture so so this, this is like wash and reuse yeah this can be washed reused this can be eto sterilized you know it, it can be sterilized with hydrogen peroxide vapor which can be uh, as, as and uh, so that and you know, the cost of this is also not much you know it comes to a, a my belly about 800 850 for the whole attire that uh, i showed you just now so you know so that becomes quite uh, reasonable also this can actually according to me be used for delivery purposes also because we always get you know you know uh, this amniotic fluid and everything gets on to us and this is so if you use a, a usual pp and a lot of fluid comes up to you that gets damaged and then you can't keep on changing for every person around so these are good enough for in you know, a delivery purposes or operation purposes you know it's up to you whether you use this and plus you use your you know usual gowns and attire over yeah. it it's also you know you know time and again we are talking about asymptomatic patients and therefore it has um, left the audience with a, a doubt how can it be covid 19 positive patient but not exhibiting any symptoms the reality is more than 60% do not manifest any symptoms and even if they do have symptoms it is very very non specific this whole issue is just 4 months old it's an evolving thing we have still to recognize but there have been suppose i am tested positive everybody in my house nobody else has any symptoms but because they are my contacts they will be tested and they will also in all likelihood turn positive because it's a the droplet transmission or the fomite transmission so you cannot say that every covid 19 positive will have symptoms that's a no no more it's on the contrary that most of them may not even have any symptoms that is uh, the reality and therefore we cannot guess and test everybody jayan the question to you i want to put is about the new upcoming practitioners what is their outlook on getting into practice as well as our old time old timers like us There's yeah. so much change that is happening. Yeah. What do you foresee in the private nursing homes? The challenges for the owners as well as the team of uh, visiting consultants, etc. Coming to the newcomers, I really feel sorry for them. Really, they are scared of getting into a public service because they are scared of these COVID cases. Because we say for the next two years, 2022, we may see a change. So what shall I do for my bread and butter up to 2022? So I am not willing to go to public sector. Regarding the corporate hospitals, since the number of inpatients have come down, they are not recruiting people. Can you start a practice of your own? Is a big question because initiating a practice and getting money is a big problem. Normally, we used to take two to three years to settle down our practice, but now it will take more time. So, for the beginners, my humble suggestion will be: you have had friends in your college days, even as a postgraduate, you are together doing a combined study. So, try to give the art of giving, which even yesterday I saw. I uh, they say Pooja Sri Ravi Shankar talking about. So, learn to have the art of giving. Give and take. So a couple of people join together and start a yeah, practice, so that whatever may be the profit you can share, maybe very rarely we go in for a loss. Even if it is a loss, initially it will be a small loss. Can I have an administrator on whose umbrella we can walk in and walk out with our work alone? the administrator will always expect his own share he will take his share first for the this thing establishment then only give you here it is quite a questionable one so i would like you to have the art of giving and take it up for the seniors like me especially with the two sectors at trichirapalli and chennai and being above the age of 
travel permitted but still i have a pass to go up and down until lockdown that is a different story but it is so difficult because we have been handling only high risk pregnancies somebody i saw a question on placenta previa on 18th i have posted a, a central placenta previa with more of anterior extension with six units of blood four units are already made ready and she is now in the 37th week next week will be the 38th week she is asking me her mother in law is little ill can i postpone and the difficulty is we can keep the blood for only some time the blood banks are not willing to store the blood for this see so how are we at 2 o'clock in the night if i get the patient how am i going to manage so for seniors like us who have been handling difficult cases the difficulty is more we get lot of vasomotor imbalance i really sweat when i have this problem right now i did a PSA delivery of a 12 year married woman who is wolf parkinson white syndrome positive so we have the cardiologist in the theater and we have the anesthetist with the big set as dr sanjay gupta was saying the sets pp sets and other things the economic imbalance on the doctors can we charge more patients are little angry so can i add another 5000 rupees to my theater charge because i have used five to six sets of this that is a questionable these things and that makes a patient usually patients are the good representatives for us and go and tell outside that doctor is courteous and respectful and she charges average now she will go and say she charge double the charge which she earlier was put so my image will automatically go down at my age i may not feel bad but the people who are at the 50s will definitely have the difficulties this doctor exposing the ground uh, realities of what may ensue in practice especially because there has been a substantial gap with a substantial confusion dr raksha can you go ahead and ask now the uh, viewers have warmed up and they have snowballing many 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 questions to us so let's uh, respond to what they wanted on raksha please yes ma'am so we have a lot of interesting questions so professor hanon he asked that uh, precautions during surgeries is there any aerosol component of covid um yes uh, most of our surgeries luckily can be done and are done with regional anesthesia so that has been a huge advantage because any aerosol producing procedure as in the intubation and the general anesthesia is a clear no no and the uh, uh, long sinus laparoscopic surgeries of lengthy and then the precautions that we have to take for c section is first of all the patient definitely has to have a mask and um, the regional anesthesia be given once the block acts then the whole team who is donning the pp should enter the um, theater and quickly finish the procedure and come out the reverse is the true uh, for the patient who cannot be given regional anesthesia for any region reason and then quickly we have to give her a ga then the whole team with the pp has to be standing inside the theater as soon as the ga is given do your case and move out the covid dedicated centers usually have their own set of residents with the ppe with their um, duty rota around the clock for few hours only because once you don the regular ppe you can't go to the restroom nor can you uh, have a sip of water even so the obstetric team essentially in these covid dedicated center just do their job and move out even before uh, the procedure the fetal hearts etc we don't go close and see it's just on a um, uh, cardiotocograph machine and then we have to tap our information from there and post procedure also the uh, protocols for just seeing the vitals of the patients uh, uh, and the general care is done by the team of doctors in the covid dedicated centers and we have actually very um, remotely to monitor the patient these are the precautions so aerosol producing the procedures at the ga if we can avoid them we should avoid them dr gupta you have any other points yeah, to add on this now the anesthetist have even moved on to you know given giving regional anesthesia for you know shorter procedures like you know if mtp is going to take long time if you know even os tightening is done under subtle block anesthesia and all that 
you know, so this, that they have also modified their practices everywhere. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yes, Raksha. Yeah, so Dr. Sheikh is asking, how can vitamin D3 and omega-3 supplementation be beneficial during COVID-19 pandemic? And also, do you recommend omega-3 supplementation for postpartum depression? Oh. <laughs> uh, for one thing, I was telling before also, that uh, when many of the micronutrients were bombarded into the market, we as consultants paid actually, truthfully, very little attention to that. Because like you know, it was like an also ran kind of a product. But in the recent past, um, Dr. Gupte Center, my center and some other multi centers are involved with the study with the, with the vitamin D and its nexus with the gestational diabetes mellitus. And we found uh, uh, some a lot of difference in the prevalence of GDM uh, uh, declining by more than 50-60% in uh, the vitamin D deficient patients, which are 90% of our pregnant population. So that is a new you know, thinking on the vitamin D. And it has been indeed the forerunner of the immunity building um, mechanisms how it supports and COVID-19 is all about your immune system and the fight with the virus. So even if it has not yet proved its place, we know for sure, for other reasons, we have studied vitamin D in our population. So we know for sure that they are deficient. So it is always wiser to give to make them sufficient in vitamin D. Not only this, but it will have a variety of other positive impacts. Omega-3, yes, there are lots and lots of literature support about how it can prevent the premature labor. We are embarking on a multicentric study on this and hopefully it, if it gives us good results, then just like folic acid, the vitamin D and omega-3 will also come into the mainstream of a preventive health care. Having said that, I would also want both my experts to give their point of view on the same two issues. Jayam? See, see, the thing is, basically, you know, uh, these um, factors are studied in nutrigenomics now. You know, nutrigenomics is a science in itself. And they have studied many of these factors. And we have come to know that they, these, especially, for example, zinc, you know, folic acid, B12, they play a huge role in our epigenetics. That means, you know, they can either uh, lead to the expression of some good genes or they can suppress some, you know, bad genes. And that's what is epigenetics is all about. And so nutrigenomics now tells us that these micronutrients have a huge role to play, you know, in this particular way. You know, we used to talk about only, you know, deficiencies and, yeah. you know, deficiencies and all those and so little bit of zinc what is going to, what it is going to do but no it has been proved now epigenetic affects not only the mother but it affects the baby you know and that's why uh, this is very important so we have to choose we have to find out the rationale behind every, you know, every use has to be correct but that use is now going to be at a nutrigenomics level not just deficiency level or RDA level and so the, the thinking on these have expanded and penetrated deeper than uh, what we thought it was. Jayam, you have any point on this to add? Yes. Coming to the practical aspect of it, we know well our patients very rarely comply with our prescriptions. But to be very happy to say, I see all my patients who are prescribed omega-3 fatty acids, vitamin D, calcium, iron, and protein supplement, they are all purchasing the medicine in the pharmacy after January 15th. That is really a thing. That is necessity makes the man accept things. So now that it's a good time in which all practitioners should start prescribing this instead of thinking, I should write only one drug. I should not write five or six drugs. That we have to dispense with and doctors first should initiate writing iron, calcium, folic acid, omega-3 fatty acids and vitamin D plus respect for maternity care. And they are this thing of saying a companion at the time of delivery. Now we have to shrink our idea because the government has not given that approval in the present time. 
So, uh, I, 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 I would yes, slightly uh, you know deeper there that you know we can think of prescriptions, but there are lot of you know good food products you know which we can also advise the patients. So this you know because many of the things if they come naturally like we know. Okay, in Tamil Nadu, it's a yes. poem and a vegetable market. Which is a source. So nobody is purchasing any vegetables. <laughs> Even in my house, the vegetable comes. It is quarantined for twenty-four hours under water. <laughs> okay. So market is closed for the past one week. <laughs> this market is not there. So that is very difficult. Non-vegetarian, they are not taking vegetables. Are also the market is closed. I can't get coriander leaves. I can't get curry leaves. The small packet which used cost me two rupees is now not even available for hundred rupees. Okay. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think it's a worthwhile uh, remark for now. But what Dr. Gupta is telling is, you know, long term. Long term. So we as um, uh, we as medical professionals are often used to prescribe, but we are not paying enough attention. In fact, the diabetes segment has brought the MNT or medical nutritional therapy right onto the forefront. We are collaborating with dietitians to understand more how to tell the patient in a practical way so that it just gets implemented. The same has to occur for many other things that we have uh, just mentioned. So slowly and steadily, yes, when we said that many things will change in the post-COVID era, and this is also one of the main things which we have to doubly pay attention to. We were just, you know, just taking it in the passing. Okay, the saying, so we are prescribing. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. But then this is either by diet or by supplement. See to it that it gets into her system because it is important that it gets into her system for deficiency sufficiency reasons as well as the epigenetic unfolding and, uh, you know, uh, triggering of many, many of the dreadful problems and comorbidities that the patient can have. So both things are uh, well taken. Thank you. Raksha. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so can PCR uh, results change during pregnancy? How is it interpreted otherwise? Dr. Bugelo is asking. <laughs> Dr. Bugelo, thank you very much for the question. Dr. Gupta, you go first and I'll add. I, I, I didn't get the question. Yeah, the question is about uh, RT-PCR, the throat swap testing. Can it go wrong sometimes? Yeah, Raksha, was that the question? Yeah. Can PCR results change during pregnancy? How is it interpreted otherwise? Yeah. No, the PCR results per se will not change in pregnancy. You know, so we don't have to worry about it. Why the tests you know, many times come uh, you know, false negative is the sample taken is not correctly taken, you know, and that, that's the reason, you know, and that's why we have to allow for those you know, false negativities. If the samples taken are absolutely correct and the tests done are for both, you know, there are N and you know, there are two proteins, N and S proteins, then definitely the test will come much more positivity. If we wait a little while longer, I'm sure, you know, there are a lot of tests in the making in next three or four weeks you are going to get a simpler test and you know cheaper test and i think the number of tests also will go on uh, increasing and i'm talking about the the antigen testing antibody testing is a different ball game altogether but even antigen testing now card tests are going to come you know the uh, what are called as lcr testings are going to come they are all in the research and they will be available to us in 3 to 4 weeks i think and then the, you know, the testing is going to be much more you know, easier and cheaper compared to what we are getting now. Yeah, there's yet another reason. One is the wrong methodology of swabbing. So we need a trained personnel to take the swabs. That's for sure. The second thing is the first five to six days where the second patient incubation is in the incubation period. period. You're doing the test too early. Then the RT-PCR will not come uh, positive. That's another because you're testing me positive today, testing all, you know, uh, um, but the people living in my home, many of them may come negative because they may still be on the second day or third day of their um, disease process. And so given the fact that 40% are false negative, that's why two tests uh, are needed to be done and evolving tests will definitely, you know, make us more comfortable with more right. uh, definite answers. Yeah. Mm. Tell me. Yes, uh, Raksha. Yeah. So, and yeah, one important point Dr. Gupte said, 
where we again underline and re-emphasize it is not because the patient is pregnant or not pregnant that we are getting these kind of results. It is because of these two main reasons that we have just elaborated. Yes, Rakshan. So can folic acid and vitamin B12 supplementation reduce the complication in pregnancy? Um, uh, Jaya? One? Yes. <laughs> yeah, please. Folic acid has been extensively researched decades ago and it has found to reduce the neurological deficits in the babies by 372%. It was a research which was done in 1990s until date that research remains. Regarding the vitamin B12 also, a lot of research has been done about 20 years ago and they have proved acceptable. In a country where more nutrition therapy is the hallmark. Definitely, I have folic acid and vitamin B12, which we are really deficient because we are not eating bread, butter, and ham. So we are eating only vegetarian diet. And when we say non-vegetarian, it is maybe once a week or twice a week. So we are not getting the B12 exactly in the level we class to it. So supplementation has proved itself its work long ago. Yeah, now Raksha will need to give us rapid fire questions because I noticed that there are loads of very, very interesting questions and yes, we need to use this opportunity to respond to them. Yeah. So, uh, does Dr. Linda is asking, does pregnancy increase the need for critical care setting in COVID condi uh, conditions in our country? Dr. Gupta. Pregnancy as such requires yeah, serious care because every pregnancy is a bullet. She comes from a lower socioeconomic status, she can bleed. She can go in for atonic PPH. So a regular serious care is required, but not a critical care. Okay. Fortunately, fortunately, as far as you know the present situation is concerned, though we say that you know the pregnant patients are more vulnerable because they're they're slightly immune suppressed compared to the usual situation because of the uh, you know, steroids in their body. But other than that, fortunately, you know, the overall, if you see the pregnancy and delivery scenario, because these patients are young, you know, they have done extremely well in most of the circumstances. So it's not that because, you know, patient is pregnant and this is, corona situation is going on, that means the patient is going to be more uh, I have to get into the critical care unit or needing critical care unit. That that will be unnecessarily uh, creating panic, you know, among the patients. Uh, I I would really think we have to uh, compartmentalize our thinking into uh, verticals. One is if it's a low risk pregnancy, and there is no comorbidity, there is no cardiac disorder, no hypertensive disorder, no diabetes in pregnancy, no anemia, no malnutrition. That's a different bracket. So that uh, it goes well and most patients are asymptomatic. Most patients are of a mild variety and the recovery is very, very good. Like mortality or complications just because of COVID are like, uh, minuscule. Having said that, the other compartment which I want everybody to pay attention is we have said that first of all, you have to suspect and test. And if you've tested, whether she comes into mild, moderate or severe category, because if she's really having any of these comorbidities, we've had patients with uh, cardiac disease with uh, COVID positive, very severe respiratory distress. Yes, then she is a critically ill, serious uh, case of uh, COVID positive who needs uh, uh, care in the dedicated COVID center with all the other expertise, which are really non obstetric so that is, you know, whether all patients who are tested positive will not be severe. They may be, most of them will be mild. Some of them will be moderate with little respiratory distress, where they will need the chest X-ray, where they'll need a repeat X-ray to see whether the um, progression of the lung disease has been there. And if they are deteriorating, then you'll need the S um, Q S O F S score, and all of these. With that's why they said anybody with comorbidity. Pulse oximeter is now newly added even to the home quarantine. They have to uh, report uh, the readings on an everyday basis. So this is how you would, you know, think and look at it. But 
overall as clinicians we really really have to pay attention to the covid positives because we don't know how it's going to evolve in that particular case yes so is covid testing mandatory at 36 weeks government policy is changing every day if not possible then how to manage dr janti is asking that <laughs> This is a million dollar question, <laughs> Sanjay. <laughs> you know, the, get your million dollars. <laughs> initially, yes, the ICMR came out with the idea that five days before delivery, you know, you should be testing every patient. Now the question is, how do we know it's you know five days before delivery? You know, in a normal situation, are we going to check every five days, which is going to cost? Around you know five thousand uh, rupees, and the cost of those te- that testing is going to be you know more than uh, actual uh, sometimes even you know a delivery cost. Having said that, again we know that there are false negative uh, you, know, you know test results. We know that there are asymptomatic patients. So I think this policy that every patient needs to be you know uh, COVID tested before uh, uh, del- delivery from thirty six. weeks onwards to me it doesn't really make any sense to make sure that assume that this she can be a asymptomatic covid patient and take all the due precautions while delivering her and that's a more practical way of doing because she may come in as an emergency any time or she may have contacted covid two days after you have done the testing so you know all these situations remain Yes. So even though uh, she is tested negative, she may actually be COVID positive. So that's the message that we all have to take. So whether you test or not, you presume in your head that she is positive. Please, please, please take all the precautions. In the middle, many of you would have noticed that Sanjay put on another different type of a headgear. <laughs> the one side that showcases the variety of you know the PPEs yes. that he has. Meanwhile, I want Jayam to respond about Tamil Nadu situation of. antenatal testing where have we reached what is the thinking process in tamil nadu for antenatal corona virus testing is done 10 days prior to the due date only in the government centers and in private setups are very few probably in places like chennai tiruchirappalli madurai and coimbatore people may be able to do in a private setup otherwise in all the other talk sites it is very difficult to do a covid testing because they have to go through the government which will emphatically say that come if you are due on 22nd you come on 12th before that they are not testing i had a patient who was 31 by due date she was 30% effaced i sent her rushed her to government hospital on 95 to do the covid test she was sent out So luckily on eleven five, I could find somebody in Tamil Nadu is doing the test at ten five yesterday morning. So I rushed up to the hospital testing center, took the patient and got it tested. Sat for the report, and luckily today morning I got the report. Patient is now having ninety nine point five degrees temperature and she has been delivered. What shall I do? how can i go and ask the government complain about this government staff saying they will do because they have been instructed to do only 10 days before because of the huge load of testing that they are doing in tamil nadu literally pathetic for the government side also but still we have our patients who are delivering at 37 38 weeks so it is a difficult situation we have to accept this enforces and underscores and underlines dr gupte's point that it will be impractical and really not feasible to test all our patients 10 days 15 days before the delivery yeah and also uh dr gupta i just want one more input from you today you've done the c section you you know you've taken all precautions she is like uh, presuming she is uh, covid positive the section has gone well child okay mother okay everything or right, she is wearing her mask she is hand sanitizing feeding the baby etc etc next day she develops a little bit of fever and then she also says that okay she has little difficulty in breathing what is then your next approach to her right. now you have started worrying whether she may these may be the symptoms of uh, covid 19 what will you do can uh, she stuck with you <laughs> yeah the very first this thing one shouldn't you know rush with the idea that oh she has become covid positive now 
एट द सेम टाइम वॉट वन वुड डू इज की इफ शी इज नॉट इन अ सिंगल रूम she should be isolated you know just as a, a precaution only limited staff should then attend to her one should try to find out many other causes that we usually have for fever on the you know second or third day it just can be uh, simple you know engorged breast causing the, the issue also or you know urinary infection so that quickly one can uh, do that but yes the new signs that you yourself mentioned like anosmia is there you know if the spo2 is showing unusually low levels then yes then we do have to go for covid testing then we have to think about whether she really needs shifting to a covid dedicated you know hospital this should be thoughts in your mind but you know first do you know be uh, just do you know, justify test think about the patient and the family what she is going to uh, you know go through think about the baby whether you need to you know take care of the baby in a different way so it should be patient centric care and not just you know uh, whatever just the whatever the people out there are saying oh fever send her send her immediately take her out of your hospital take her to the you know government center in a covid hospital i think i wouldn't do that at the at the same time um, you know there is a question about uh, how you will take care of your uh, your own health status or your staff's health status so for this i would say that every single staff of yours they have to have the temperature check every single day and they have to have the symptom check every single day because the ones with the temperature and the symptom check they need to be further uh, investigated that's for sure and then if you have come to know that any patient that they have seen in the previous week or this particular patient which dr gupte may suspect eventually and said for the covid testing as he particularly mentioned just put her in a single room see to it that the limited staff attend there so that if it, the test comes positive only they will have to then you know be traced and uh, the uh, further quarantining etc uh, need to be done so this is the minimum that we must do to all our staff and some of the private hospitals are also using their own discretion to give the hcq but please please tell your staff also if you have given them prophylactic hcq for their care no sense no room for complacency they have to do everything that they have to do otherwise you know that that's a must yes i think sir. absolutely rightly said you know the screening of the staff every day is very very important you know because you know uh, some somebody in their family somebody in their neighborhood you know can be infected and we would not have asked about it and so every day when they are screened for temperature and you know uh, given sanitize when they change their clothes coming in the history of the patient by a responsible person of the staff should be taken and asked you know because i am more worried about you know my you know the infection coming to the hospital for, by the staff because they come from various places and all then my patients you know because if they are the ones who are really scared and worried and isolated isolated themselves in the house everybody is taking care of them so the staff factor is very very crucial and important yeah so it's like a two way the staff may carry infection from home to the hospital or the uh, staff may carry infection from the hospital to home so everywhere that you need to be guarded see since uh, we are in the leadership position dr gupte dr jayan karna and myself all of them there is always a query and it's been asked twice already how does the national body look at the status of every patient delivering with us should be known therefore do the covid testing what does the national body say about it i would think that yes that is one of the ideal situation because in our minds then you know we know that uh, you know we know the status so we know of what we are dealing with but it is not going to be practical because of the two main reasons that we said because um, it's absolutely not feasible to do 20 million tests uh, and uh, when in pregnancy she get positive whether repeatedly you keep on doing every week the test because if she is not uh, yet delivering from 36 weeks onwards so it's going to cause a huge sea of confusion it will not be cost effective the test is negative it doesn't even mean anything so it it is for now the organizations outlook that it has to be a universal precautions to be taken for all with a rational use of pp 
and innovative designs from people in the leadership position like Dr. Gupta, maybe that is what we have to take on board rather than pushing for uh, the uh, tests and creating uh, more uh, confusion. Would you both uh, agree with this? Yes, perfectly. It is yeah. not the test. It is the social distance, 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 yeah. which we have to keep and maintain for the next two years to come with sanitation, at least with the ordinary soap, with the regular hand washing, which we have said, keeping the hygiene of our earlier times, you know, we used to say, if you are having menstruation, don't touch anything. Like that, if you go outside and come back home, don't touch anything. Have a good shower wash, because it's a summer month, and then get into your house. Don't touch anything in the house. Should be for doctor, staff nurse, patients, and their husbands and others. Earlier they used to say, you know, a delivered baby should not be touched by anybody else. Only the mother should handle, or a one other attendant. That is why I told all the husbands, don't go and touch your child. See, because there may be many unanswered uh, questions because this is an evolving thought process. But then the first thought process is, if we know the status, it will be like really good. And the second thought process is, no, that is not going to be practical and it may not serve any purpose. So we are also, you know, before jumping to conclusions and giving any kind of advice from the forum of our national organization, we need a, a proper mature uh, thinking process of what is pragmatic and what is practical for low middle income countries like ours. Raksha. Yeah. So the question is, a pregnant COVID patient recovers from infection, then what will be nutritional requirements in future? Oh, high protein uh, for sure. And all the nutrient supplements. If no vegetables, then supplements. If vegetables, then all the things that Dr. Gupta was mentioning, all those things have to be given because uh, the uh, protein uh, in critical care, the proteins which they give as a nutritional supplement for healing, etc., has been underplayed in our um, obstetric uh, practice, which is now, you know, we are paying uh, increasing amount of uh, attention to that. So, Proteins on one hand and uh, immunity builders and micronutrients on the other hand, I think that would make a composite, uh, you know, advice to our patients. Yeah. So, but, yeah. Any precautions needed for the baby in case of COVID-19 infected pregnant mother? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. The minute the delivery occurs, the baby is shifted to the next room. The baby should not be handled by the mother. Next thing is giving the breast milk. It is the best way to give it as an expressed breast milk. And in case the mother feels very difficult to express the breast milk, the mother has to feed the baby with all the guidelines which are given by the government on breastfeeding a baby in a COVID positive patient. The patient should be covered very much like the kiosk where only the hand comes out, only the nipple should be seen outside and the child should it. And the mother should not have handle the baby, caress the baby at the time of giving the breastfeed and should not directly look at the baby. That is very, very important. If supposing she is in a place where she doesn't have that help of this expressive feed on looking after the baby by somebody else, this is the best way. Every mother has to protect. All mothers are willing to do the best for the baby. And it is better that you don't look at your baby. Regarding the baby's hygiene measures, changing the, the sewage materials and other things, she has to see that somebody is available to take care of those things. It is not only breastfeed, it is a hygiene of the baby, especially in the summer season in India. It is very, very important. And are there pediatricians to see the baby after two days, five days, and find out jaundice at newborn? Yes, it is a big question. Probably if she is in the hospital, it will be getting better. If she is not having any symptoms, she is at the home. This becomes really an audience. And I hope the neonatal care continues and we don't see too much of neonatal mortalities. Yeah, I would like Sanjay to give his opinion, but I want to again check with Raksha whether this particular question was 
a covid positive mother handling the baby or just uh, any routine delivery case so what was the question a covid positive oh, mother okay. Uh huh. Sanjay. I am not giving opinion, but I'm sorry. I'm. I have to. You know, I have got a oh. case, and I don't. You know, <laughs> yeah. It's four thirty, so you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so, so I think I'm that's sorry. why. I'm, uh -huh. Thank you, everyone. You know, I think it's a, uh, so many people are attending, and I'm you know very glad. But Dr. Emma and Dr. Jaim are there to take care of. The, I'm sure any kind of questions. So please allow me to leave. Uh, thank you, Subhu. Thank you, Raksha, everyone. But we really, really appreciate uh, Dr. Gupte that you've spent so much time with us and given some very mature, practical, sensible, doable, pragmatic, feasible thoughts uh, from your thank leadership you. position. Thank you. So thank you very, very much, and all the best for your case as well. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. See, uh, I was just mentioning that there could be many, many unanswered questions, and then you know the discussions on this can go on and on. And I confess right at the beginning that we may not. as on today have the right answers or what we say today may not be applicable for tomorrow that is the truth of the matter so we are all thinking through yes we know that there have been many people asking oh it's not practical to test every pregnant woman every week yes it is not practical that is what we are also saying that yes there is a guideline but that guideline is restricted as on today if you probe they will say that only from the containment area if the patient is coming then you will need to test but patients have also gotten smarter they are not telling that they are from the containment area because they don't want to be stigmatized and uh, uh, kept aloof so that is the truth of the matter so it is both way so in your own interest and the interest of your staff it is ideal for you to please 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 follow the universal precautions to the best extent as possible you don't have to like really don and off everything there is a rational use of pp every day there is a guideline released on the pp with the reuse with breathable pps with what is a must in which area please pay attention to all of these and go by that guidance raksha yes ma'am so the so questions please yeah so there's lot of questions asking regarding ivf and iui so during this time uh, so should we wait or should we continue like should we start doing the ivf and iui process that is an exclusive question for dr jayam bhuran yes. regarding ivf so yes. still we are not uh, very much clear of the covid effect on the blastocyst which is going to get implanted because blastocyst is one area where there is no outer covering so how it is going to get reactive to this coronavirus nobody knows there is no vertical transmission there is nothing else but still we are not aware of it so the european society has given a general guidelines to halt all aft work until the lockdown measures are over so as such in india also up to june 1st the association of clinical embryology as well as the isar has decided not to start any idea for before 16 2020 please wait for 16 2020 for the next guideline because just now there is a message from government of india all hospitals should open they should do all their work is it possible for me to post a hysterectomy tomorrow it's a million dollar question so uh, we have to wait for that guidance the embryos which are frozen kindly do not take it out and do an embryo transfer until the guidelines are very clear europe indian society of vascular reproduction and uh, association of clinical embryology or the two areas which are going on sending guidelines please wait for it and please do not get into your ivf laboratory jay may an extended question by preeti that you know uh, laparoscopic surgeries what is your take on that in the yes. the laparoscopic surgery already the uh, the singa association of laparoscopic surgeons have replaced laparoscopy with laparotomy in necessary cases minimally required even for ectopics and twisted ovarians it has been made very clear that minimal laparotomy is the answer with the regional anesthesia 
Okay, there is one more question on how do I conduct the Garbha Samskar anti rightly classes? Very yes. easy, like how we are talking to each other. So we are Wait. putting our anti rightly patient week after week after week and taking their uh, Zoom sessions in a class, small, small clusters where they can also interact. And uh, we have the dietitian, the uh, physiotherapy, both the uh, uh, and lactation expert, and the uh, gynecologist interacting with them what we used to do face to face now everything is shifted to the digital platform so also the antenatal which we have uh, already started long ago and it's uh, uh, it's really probably much more convenient to our patients because sitting in their own homes they just log on and uh, they are delighted to interact again and again the question is coming up what does the national body say about testing the healthcare providers it is both in the public and private sectors i think at the moment uh, they haven't commented anything about it because it's up to the discretion of the healthcare providers and their institution themselves that is what it is because we are not you know in any way authorized uh, to say one thing or the other about how the healthcare uh, providers will uh, and at what frequency and what consistency they will meet the testing. Therefore, we focus more on universal precautions with the uh, rational use of PP rather than just going right, left, and center for the testing protocols. Yes, uh, Raksha? Yeah, so uh, the question is why COVID-19 symptoms are not constant? How without any symptoms the corona patients tested I positive? I think I have already addressed this because I saw this question on the chat box and I looked yes. it up as to why many, many patients. It is a reality that 60%, 70% of the patients, especially pregnant patients, may have mild symptoms which they may brush it off or they may be totally asymptomatic. There's a whole cluster of symptoms, why it keeps on changing. We have to ask the virus because new set of symptoms are being added on. First, we used to think only cough, cold, flu-like symptoms, but now we know for sure that uh, maybe a fecal mode of transmission may all, is also emerging as one of the probable modes. Therefore, sanitizing the restrooms and bathrooms very, very crucial. Yes. And uh, the um, abdominal cramps and diarrhea is also a part and parcel of the uh, questionnaire. ICMR has a uh, whole list of questions that we ought to ask uh, every patient, primarily these, but any unrelated symptoms or no symptoms can also signify that it may be a forerunner for the COVID infection. Yeah? Yesterday night I saw New York governor talking about toxic shock syndrome and Takayasu's disease as a manifestation of COVID. It was something surprising. So every day the symptomatology is changing. So we will have to wait for our final answer with all our work which is going on extensively. See, again, and again, again and again, there are many questions. What has Foxy done? What, is, what does Foxy say about uh, uh, the guidelines for testing, etc.? Foxy has to fall in line with the Ministry of Health government. and with the ICMR guidelines. And uh, if we have any suggestions, First, we have to put it on board to them. Foxy leadership, inclusive of Alpesh Gandhi taking the lead, are in constant discussions. They have agreed upon something. They have not agreed upon some other things. Within our own leadership, also, we have not crystallized few of our thoughts for making more suggestions because at the moment, uh, we don't know because uh, as a mature organization, as a knowledge base and a technical expert group, we need to define uh, what is on priority to ask the ministry and uh, the ICMR. And uh, we have no evidence for many things. We have no data as of today. So we cannot just blindly um, roll out the guidelines from a professional organization unless and until it is endorsed by the ministry and ICMR. Since this question is raised now for the nth time, I'm again um, emphasizing on that. Yes, the guidelines have been released as a general sense of direction which we could give to all the members and believe me it is one of the first and foremost professional organization which has given the first guideline on 28th of march updated guidelines on 28th of april we have moved in our journey for uh, more number of things as the disease has evolved but we are also very very keen that every foxian plants their data onto the foxy registry 
please fill in the registry which is on the foxy website so that the more information that we gather the more will be our strength to make specific recommendation to the ministry and icmr so i think we can take the last question here ma'am uh, can we supplement vitamins and minerals to the patient in first trimester to improve yeah. her immunity and yeah, i think we've said it uh, i think we've said it more than once that uh, yes we need to uh, build up her strength uh, in simple ways through diet and supplements as much and uh, as long as possible because not only the pregnant women everybody has to now start being conscious about their lifestyle because the lifestyle is all about the diet and the exercise you have to really really focus on what best you can do on these two grounds to build up your own immune strength to fight against these deadly uh, diseases there's such a thin line between life and lifestyle so you need to just merge the two and uh, uh, be uh, more uh, serious rather than being casual about it are there any other burning questions uh, raksha or we can call it a day yeah i think uh, this last one question i think effect on labor pain on mother with severely affected lungs so dr veeresh is asking this question uh jay yeah definitely in labor a patient who is already having a severe uh, acute respiratory infection will have difficulty if you are putting her down for a normal delivery there has to be a pulmonologist at the head end and he has to take care of the lungs very clearly probably the minute he delivers there may be a panorama of changes which can support the sari but a patient in labor is really a serious concern for a severe acute respiratory infection and the mortality rate definitely climbs up by another 50% with addition of pregnancy to a sari patient yeah many times what happens is when she is in the i said mild moderate or severe so if she is in the severe grade of a covid uh, positive infection then super added labor pains many a times it calls in the obstetric team for an emergency intervention by an emergency c section so that uh, the delivery process is done and the child is out of the way and the uh, cardio uh, respiratory system of the mother is definitely a little more comfortable uh, when you debulk uh, as how to say the pregnancy is uh, gone so that is much more uh, uh, comfortable status for the intensive care specialist to handle the patient and pull her out of the crisis uh, from there on so uh, i must uh, place on records and acknowledge um, uh, our very humble uh, thank you to many of our guests uh, and delegates who have joined us from right across the asia pacific region from sri lanka uh, from bangladesh from nepal from african region and from uk too because this is in the true philosophy and the concept that we all can learn from each other no matter what is the gradation of the income or the literacy rate in these countries no matter what the gender is no matter what the cost is the covid-19 makes no distinctions it is the same for everybody everywhere and the greatest stress and burden is on essential services as in the child birth process primarily because many other things can be put off many other things may have come to a standstill in the backdrop of the covid 19 pandemic but the process of child birth for many many million of women who are in their ongoing pregnancy which has emerged as one of the leading causes for mental stress and anxiety like never ever before it's not only the anxiety of little known medical information it's also the anxiety of the social concerns when their near and dear ones cannot really be around them to support them the stress of the economies 
and losing the jobs and how to bring up the child, etc. And also the stress of access to the medical care itself, the plight and the stories they may have heard from other women about how they were shunted from hospital to hospital. Will my doctor be available? Will everything be safe uh, with me? Is anyway a constant question that they used to ask us, but now as if the wound is spiced with salt, that is the kind of brunt both the care providers and the care seekers are actually facing. And therefore, these knowledge exchange programs, the experiences shared, the true concerns voiced out, the confusion honestly presented, we have to thank our support given by the mayor, Vitabiotics, such a large audience in front of us so that we could place the best of the information known until date. And it's also sometimes very good to know that we don't know much. That puts the thinking in a very different perspective. That makes us more cautious than ever before. And anything that we do, whether routine or off routine, we need to think more than once. We need to update from yesterday to today because that is the rapid rate, that is the frequency with which the whole scenario is changing. So wishing ourselves the best that we could do to all our girls and women right across the continents. It's all about caring and sharing. We sign off from India, acknowledging once again the support from Mayor Vitabiotics and expressing sheer delight to many from across the world who have joined us in this deliberations today. My sincere thanks to Team Artist Asian Research and Training Institute of Skill Transfer, who is the knowledge partner to Mayer Vitabiotics. Dr. Raksha, who is the lead master trainer from this organization. Dr. G. Divakar, who is the managing director of this uh, premier institute out of Bengaluru. And our champions, Dr. Gupte and Dr. Jayam Kannan. Thank you all very, very much. We say namaste again before we sign off.